The Ilya Makayev injury. What happened? How did it happen? And what happens next? Stay tuned to find out. Hey everybody, Dr. Chris, orthopedic surgeon and sports medicine physician. Welcome to my channel, your number one source for information on orthopedic injuries and broken bones that's easy to understand for the everyday human. That's a little doctor joke we like to make around here. If you want to know more about my life as an orthopedic surgeon, be sure to follow me on Instagram or Twitter at at Stable Knees. Ilya Mikhaev. Let's talk about how he lacerated an artery and yet survived. Ilya Mikhaev is an NHL forward for the Toronto Maple Leafs. He was injured on December 27th, 2019 in a game against the New Jersey Devils. His injury occurred after he was struck by Jesper Bratt's skate. And this happened immediately after Jesper Bratt lost his balance after attempting a goal. Ilya was struck at the level of the wrist by Jesper's skate blade. He was struck on the volar aspect, or in other words, the palmer side, on the medial aspect, or in other words, the pinky side of the wrist. And this is as we would expect, because as Ilya is holding a hockey stick in his hand, the pinky side of the wrist is the one that is going to be closest to the ice and the one that is most exposed to an injury from a skate blade. The skate blade caused a laceration which damaged both the skin and the structures directly underneath that area. Immediate active bleeding from the site of the laceration suggests that a vascular injury was also one of the structures involved. And this is in contrast to the recent injury also by the same mechanism to Cal Clutterbuck. Although both players suffered volar wrist lacerations as a result of a skate blade, Cal Clutterbuck's injury did not demonstrate active immediate bleeding, suggesting that a vascular injury was not involved. In Ilya's case, however, we suspect a vascular injury as a result of this active bleeding. As I stated before, Ilya suffered a volar laceration on the ulnar aspect or the medial aspect of his wrist. The volar structures of the wrist are separated into several layers. The most superficial layer, meaning the layer closest to the skin, is comprised of four muscles. And these include the pronator teres, the flexor carpi radialis, the palmaris longus, and the flexor carpi ulnaris. The second most superficial layer includes the flexor digitorum. The structures present on the ulnar aspect of the wrist include the flexor carpi ulnaris, the flexor digitorum, the ulnar nerve, and the ulnar artery. Immediate active bleeding at the site of the laceration, we can anticipate an injury to the ulnar artery. But if the ulnar artery is involved, we can also anticipate that there must at least be an injury to the flexor carpi ulnaris and possibly also to the tendons of the flexor digitorum. The flexor carpi ulnaris controls both flexion of the wrist and adduction of the wrist. The flexor digitorum superficialis controls progressive wrist, hand, and finger flexion. The ulnar artery contributes vascular flow to the hand and fingers via the superficial palmar arch. And the superficial palmar arch is just a structure that gives rise to a number of smaller arterial structures in the hand and fingers. The ulnar nerve provides sensation to the ulnar one and one half fingers as well as motor function to all of the intrinsic muscles of the hand and fingers. Ilya was immediately taken to the hospital where he underwent emergency surgery. Ilya would have undergone a history and a physical examination upon arrival to the emergency department. Here they would assess the nature of his injuries and confirm the presence of a vascular injury. An injury of this nature would require immediate treatment. Typically, the treatment for this type of injury would include the following. Administration of tetanus toxoid if his tetanus status were unknown, and this is to prevent tetanus, or lockjaw, which can occur as a result of contamination of the wound with Clostridium tetani. And this is the bacteria that causes tetanus or lockjaw. And this is an infection that can commonly occur after laceration with a metal object. Administration of intravenous antibiotics to prevent infection. The type of antibiotics that are administered are determined by the size of the wound, 
the presence of any gross contaminants in the wound, the presence or absence of allergies in the patient. Typically, patients would be treated with ANSA, a third generation cephalosporin antibiotic. And this is basically a more modern derivative of penicillin. Wounds that were significantly large would be also treated with gentamicin or a derivative. Wounds that were significantly contaminated, especially with fecal matter, might also be treated with an antibiotic known as flagell and an irrigation and debris mount of the wound. And this just basically means that we would wash out the wound with a large amount of sterile saline in order to remove any contaminants from the wound. In addition, the wound edges would be trimmed to allow better repair and to remove any necrotic or dead tissue from that area. Laceration to tendons or vascular structures would also be performed. In Ilya's case, we know that at least one tendon was repaired. Typically, after debridement, an end-to-end -end tendon repair would be performed. And generally speaking, the strength of this repair would be determined by the number of suture strands that cross the site of injury. And basically, this just means if you want the repair to be stronger, you're going to place more suture strands across the repair. As Ilya also suffered an injury to his ulnar artery, we know that a vascular repair was also performed. The type of repair performed depends on the type of injury. If the vessel has only suffered a nick or a longitudinal cut down the sidewall, then simple figure eight suture repair can be performed. However, if the artery has been transected or completely cut in two, then an end-to-end -end anastomosis will be performed. Occasionally, if significant vascular tissue has been lost during the injury and the subsequent debridement, then a vascular graft will be added to the repair to help to increase with its strength. So now that we know what happened and how it was treated, what does this mean for Ilya Makayev in the future? Ilya is expected to miss at least three months while he undergoes healing and rehabilitation following his injury. We can expect him to be splinted for at least six weeks in a functional position to protect the tendon repair. Following confirmation of healing of both the tendon and the artery, he will undergo an extended period of rehabilitation in order to restore full active function of his wrist, hand, and fingers. If all goes well during the healing process, we can expect that Ilya will be able to return to regular active play without any significant deficits once his rehabilitation is complete. So there you have it. Today we've been talking about the Ilya Makayev injury, how he cut an artery and survived. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe and keep your eyes open for membership options. Come to this channel soon. And as always, that's been a word from Dr. Chris, not your everyday ortho. Just a flesh wound.